Welcome, friends and fans, to another edition of GalaxyCon Live, where we are bringing the convention experience directly to you. And today we are joined by an amazing guest with a fantastic body of work, and now is the time for all of you in our chat room to begin typing in your questions for him. Immediately after this session, you will have the opportunity to talk to him directly through our private chat options, as well as shop our selection of personalized autographs, all of which are available now at GalaxyCon.com. So without further ado, he is an actor whose careers include The Critic, high, high School High, and of course, a seminal run on SNL. And now, live from GalaxyCon, it's John Lovitz. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And <laughs> oh. as always, is my faithful dog, Jerry, who likes being on camera. Oh, well, hello, Jerry. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, he gets on camera, and then he doesn't say anything. Oh, well, okay. Well, uh, Jerry comes to be on. It's very strange. <laughs> Indeed. I think I, I saw you a few weeks ago. You got a Siamese running around there, too, don't you? Yeah, you can hear yeah, all right. playing with a bottle cap. <laughs> Fair enough. So, John, welcome. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. You know, it's uh, as for everybody, the pandemic, you know, it's tough. But, uh, you know, it's. I think that the hardest part is just not being able to see your friends uh, and you know, I go out to dinner all the time or meals and meet, just go, let's meet for lunch. And, you know, you haven't been able to do that for so long, but it's, uh, I'm excited. I've, I got the, I got uh, vaccinated and then I'm waiting to get a second shot and then I can start traveling and working again. And, um, it's, um, it's like, oof, you know, no, absolutely. Well, and we certainly, we here at GalaxyCon, we're absolutely looking for the day when the world gets a little bit back to normal and we can once again get guests like you back on our physical stages and get you back in front of your fans. In the meantime, we've got the GalaxyCon virtual stage and it's an absolute honor to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled you asked me. Oh, no worries. No worries. So our team's, okay. through our, our team's going through our chat room right now, pulling out the questions. In the meantime... <laughs> I, I always, whenever I have a solo guest, I always start off with this. Uh, what uh, what drew you to being a performer? Uh, well, I was uh, I was seven years old, and uh, I had the, I was sick, so I had to stay home from school. And, um, and I you know grew up in the valley in, in Los Angeles and Sino and Tarzana. So anyway, I was watching TV, and they had this movie uh, about Al Jolson, the Al Jolson story with Larry Parks. Yeah. And the million dollar movie was called. So these movies, like, my God, they were a million dollars. The next day they played, um, which it was a musical. The next day was James Cagney and Yankee Doodle Dandy. Oh, and said, I want to be a singer and performer like them. And, and, uh, from, from, but I was also obsessed with baseball. So from, I, when I was seven, I go, I want to be a baseball player or a movie star, like a kid. But as I got older, I, well, you know, I got to 15 and I loved baseball. Like, I just, it was everything to me. But I just was, you know, I was just nowhere near good enough, and I realized it. And um, as much as I loved it, and so I, 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 I do little stuff in school, and in a, you know, make us. They did a show, and I was. I remember I did a show. My first show was I was eight, and there was this group called Toonsmiths, and I was really excited to be there. My dad wanted it was a doctor, but he wanted to be a singer, so we were always singing, and he would tell us about this group at school, elementary school. And I still remember my, uh, they were trying to find a line for me to sing in this song. And uh, I didn't remember the song, but the line was, uh, I, I see the things about me, the big things and the small. And maybe a couple of years ago, I'm listening to Frank Sinatra and he's singing this song and then he sings that line. And I'm like, oh, that's the song. It's like, what, that's what, it's a, what is America to me or something like that. Yeah. And the song is actually was in a movie and it won an Oscar and the song, I didn't realize it. I learned more and more about it. It was from, from a movie and it was about, you know, really racism and treating everybody with respect. And, uh, and it won an Oscar and this was in the forties that they did, yeah. you know, and, uh, but that was it. And then I did play, I did like a speech at school. I did, took an acting class in eighth grade. I did, I did started doing plays in high school in the 10th grade. And then I went, and then, and then I just said, I think I want to keep doing this. So a friend said, you should go to UC Irvine, University of California, Irvine. Mm. I went there for four years and I just, I just really wanted to do it. And then when I was, anyway, that, that's how it started. Uh, absolutely fair. Absolutely fair. So, uh, 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 so you graduated and uh, when did uh, Groundlings come about? Well, after college, I, I took a class, this guy, Tony Barr, great teacher uh called uh acting for the uh, or film actors workshop he wrote a book called acting for the camera if you want to get it in a, 
I did that for a year and a half. I went to, it wasn't getting any work. Went to New York for like 11 months to the Renaissance Fair, did this Lady Windermere's fan play, Oscar Wilde play. Uh, but I wasn't getting any work. And in LA, my friends, oh, I, I have a cousin, Bob Lovitz, who's, who's uh, my first cousin. And it was, he grew up in Chicago right out of high school. He went to Juilliard to be an actor. Oh, wow. we, we didn't, we'd only met maybe twice. And then, but we, in New York, we met, we became really close. And it, we were just like, God, we both want to be actors. Like who knew? And, and, um, but he was saying, I go, I don't know. Should I go back to LA? He goes, yeah, you can't even audition. You're not even in the union. He goes, I'm in the union. It's tough getting work. So I went, I went back and that's when I decided to go to the groundlings. I was 25. I'd heard about it forever. And I was in, in the Valley and you had to drive to Hollywood and I got on the freeway and I was sobbing. I was so scared because hmm. I was really committing in my heart to be a, a comedian. And no one was saying you should be a comedian. It was me. I, I saw um, Woody Allen's first movie, Take the Money and Run. thought he was hilarious. I used to do his and Lenny Bruce's uh, routines in my college dorm. <clears throat> you know, so I was like, I, I, sh I shot a moose. <laughs> yeah, that whole routine. Yeah, I yeah, did that yeah. routine. Yeah, yeah, I know a part. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's brilliant. I learned how to write from listening to, you know, stuff like that. And uh, I would do, yeah, I shot a moose. I was hunting in upstate yeah. New York and I shot a moose. I wrote it out on these index cards, this whole, that whole, he, you know, that whole routine that Woody Allen did about, and it was really about, you know, anti-Semitism. But anyway, I wrote it yeah. and, a, and a, I would mark where his voice went up and down. And I didn't realize I was teaching myself how to deliver jokes, but that's what I was doing. And, um, and I, so I, I was so scared and then I get in class and I got on stage and they, and I did some improv and the teacher, Randy Bennett from Texas goes, well, that was good, but you could have done this way. You could have done this way. You could have done this way. And I was like, oh my God, this is the first time they're not saying, shut up, be quiet. <laughs> it was like saying, you can, you can fuck around this way. You can be goofy this way. There's another way you can goof around. Here's another way you can goof around. Yeah. It was like school for class clowns, which I was. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, oh my God, I'm in heaven. I was so excited and of course, all my fear went away. And I realized that the fear was from not like going for, going for it a hundred percent, which I had that problem. A lot of people do, they go, well, what if I try as hard as I can? And then I don't make it. Then everyone goes, see, I told you, you know what I mean? Cause people, they always want to squish your dreams. When you go yeah. for what you really want to do, people that aren't doing that try to squish it cause they're, Envy. I don't know what that. They're envious, or they're jealous, or they're they're you're they're looking at their fears. They're really talking about themselves. And um, so anyway, I, my fear went away. I mean, it, it didn't totally go away, but you don't know what's going to happen. But I was so thrilled. And so I and a, a friend of my father's, uh, Ty Andrews, was a big actor, great guy, and he was on the uh, the TV show The Mod Squad in the '60s. Mm. And I told him, I, uh, you know, I was taking class. He goes, Look at you. He goes, you, these things, you can't just goof around. A lot of kids just goof around. He goes, you get out of it what you put into it. Yeah. All right. So I took it really serious. I go, I'm going to treat this like a college class. And I took notes every class, everything he said. I typed it all up. At the end of the class, I said to him, I, t I handed him the class. I had it all typed up. I go, here. He goes, what's this? I go, this is your class. He goes, what? <laughs> and he opened it. Everything was typed up. He goes, oh, my God. I did like a report on this. It was, yeah. I, I, I just said, I'm not doing this to... I go, I'm not here just to see, well, it's, I'm here to get a career, you know? Yeah. And, I, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll, at the time there was like 256 small theaters in LA. This was in 1981, but it was yeah. very, still extremely competitive and you had to audition to get in and I, and I would have been auditioning, wasn't getting in any. And I thought, well, the Groundlings, they have a school, it's like a ladder system. So at least you have a yeah. chance to work your way up the ladder. So my goal was get, uh, you know, get in the, take the classes, get in, the, get in the group, get seen and get work. And, and that idea was not my own. A friend of mine, Mike Sabatino from college, he, he was a, ended up being a big actor on soap operas and, and Knott's Landing. He was on Knott's Landing. And, mm -hmm. But he, I remember after college, he graduated right before me. I didn't know what to do. He goes, well, everything's filmed. We only did theater. Yeah. So I, I'm taking a class to film actors workshop. And then one time I was talking to him, he goes, I got an agent. I go, how? He goes, well, I was doing a play. I got on stage. He goes, they, they can't see you if you're not on stage. I went, oh, yeah. I didn't know anything, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, okay, I'll get in this group, get on stage, get seen, get work. 
Never, never in a million years did I think I'd be on Saturday Night Live. And what happened was it took about, I was class for about a year because it was spread. It wasn't as in demand. It was, you had to wait till they had the next class, but they had beginning, intermediate, advanced. And I'd work yeah. my way up. I got into Sunday company. I was in there for about a year. <clears throat> And I, you could have been voted up after six months, and I wasn't. But the, after a year, I thought, well, now they're moving up people that I think I'm better than. And the, but I didn't get moved up. So the so the, the artistic director Tom Maxwell said, well, we're doing this show. Let's see how we work together. And the, and uh, and it was 1984, the Olympic Arts Festival, and Phil Hartman uh, was doing this character Chick Hazard. They picked yeah. him to do a, a show around his character, which was like, and Chick Hazard was like a detective, a spoof on a like, uh, you know, Humphrey Bogart from the 40s, those detective <clears throat> movies. And, and he had that, that patter, that yeah. character. I, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, would, we would always do that. But I'd never met him. And, you know, Phil was like the king of the groundlings. He was like, a, in, in everyone's mind, he was a giant star, you know. And, and uh, he had a house. He had a, a new car. He had a job. He had money. We, and all of us were dead broke. And... Uh, so I said, well, so Tom goes, well, you could understudy a part. And I go, whose idea was that? He goes, Phil's. I go, Phil knows who I am? <laughs> That's how big he was, you know. Yeah. It was Gregory Peck's idea. <laughs> Gregory Peck knows who I am? What? I couldn't believe it. So they have this hallway with these lockers and, and you, you know, like a tall locker and you put all your costumes in it. So I was at my locker and I see Phil walking down the hallway. I'd never met him. Uh, and he's in his costume, so he's got his fedora, and he's just, and he looks like the character, and he's got the beard and the makeup and everything, and he's walking down. I'm like, wow. And I go, hey, oh, hi, Phil, I'm John Lovitz. He goes, yeah, John, I know who you are. I go, you do? Oh, yeah, I've seen your work. I think you're great. I go, oh, thanks. I go, well, thanks for recommending me to understudy this part. And he goes, yeah, you'll, I, you'll be fantastic. He walked on, and I, in my mind, I thought, my God, Phil Hartman spoke to me. And so I did the play, and... Uh, the first show I did, this is crazy. Lorraine Newman, who'd been in the Growlings and on Saturday Night Live, she came to the show. She was shooting the movie Perfect with John Travolta. Mm. She brings him to the show, and he was at his peak. He was huge, you know. Yeah. I, I think I found out afterward they were there. But anyway, they come back, and Lorraine goes, well, how, how long have you been doing the show? I go, it's my first night. She goes, no, but really, how long? I go, it's my first night. She goes, no, really. I go, no, it's my first night. She goes, will you stop? Goofing around, how long have you been doing it? Go, no, no, I'm telling you, this is my first show. I go, I, I, I'm understanding, and this is my first night. She went, you're kidding. I go, no, I, I, I didn't. So anyway, she befriended me, and uh, and I got in the groundlings, and so I was like, a, you know, so grateful to Phil and Tom, and and, uh, and then I ended up. That was in September of '84. Then January of '85. They had a new show, and so I was doing my liar character. So in March, unbeknownst to me, um, but the third week in March on a Sunday, I had a, you know, a voicemail machine. I get all these calls. Congratulations, congratulations, John. It's great. About 20 calls. And I'm like, wow. But no one's saying what it's for. I have no yeah. idea. They're just congratulating me. I don't know what they're talking about. So on Monday, I called Tom Maxwell, and he has a southern accent, too. He's from North Carolina. I go, Tom. I go, what's going on? I go, everyone's congratulating me. Why? He goes, he goes, we're going on the Tonight Show. I go, who? He goes, you and Tim Stack and Wendy, you're doing the liar character and the truckman's piece with Tim Stack and and uh, Don Woodard and Mindy Sterling and Kate Benton are going on. I go, what? When? He goes, Thursday. <clears throat> Thursday? Yeah. And so we're screaming. I need it. It turns out that the, the tonight's Jim McCauley producer was there on Saturday night watching the show. I didn't know. No one had told me. Not that they should. I, I had no idea. Yeah. And uh, and so we we get there, and I was so nervous. We get there about three o'clock because if I did my first two lines, and if the audience didn't get it, it, it didn't work. And the first lines were like, you know, hello, my name is Tommy F uh, Flanagan. I'm a member of Pathological Liars Anonymous. In yeah. fact. I, I, I'm, I'm the president of that organization. Yeah, that's the ticket. So they didn't get that, you know, 
it didn't work. So half the time it worked, half the time it didn't, you know. And I would say those lines, and when it worked, they'd be like, oh, you know, it like took them off. <laughs> so I get there and I was really nervous. So we go to rehearsal and then I'm out there. I'd never been there. So, and this is the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And, and when I was at the, at, after college, in my acting class, we'd, go, we'd have a class, we'd go get something to eat at this Howard Johnson's hotel. All we would talk about is, what are you going to say when you get on, make it on The Tonight Show? That's all we would say. We would say this for years, you know. Now I'm on The Tonight Show. Anyway, you get out there. And by the way, when you were a comedian back then, if you got on The Tonight Show and you did well, you had a career. Yeah. So it was huge. So like the biggest break you could get. Uh, especially, like, if, especially if he invited you over. Yeah, the tonight show. Here we go. So I get out there, but I was in a guest. I was doing sketches with the Groundlings, and um, felt weird too because I just got in the company. People have been there for years, and they picked me. I'm like me. What about Phil? What about Tim Stack? Oh, Tim was on it, but what about the you know? I, but anyway, so we we go to, out there, and you look up, and uh, I've done the Tonight Show with. Uh, 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 Jimmy Fallon, and he's in a much smaller studio. This thing had like three times as many people. It was like 380 people. The, and you looked up, and the ra look, the Groundlings is 99 seats. This thing was like 380, so it looked gigantic. And the, it looked like the ceilings went to the heaven. And you're like this. And so I said, director, I go, where do I look? He goes, just play it to camera, which was the best advice ever. Because you realize, well, there's you see comics on there now, and they're looking all around, you know. Yeah. On, with Jay Leno, they do, and you go like, play to camera. That's where the audience is. There's five million people in that camera. <clears throat> There's 380 here, but they're right there, you know. So I go, okay, I know where to look. And then I didn't know what to do. Then around quarter to six, or they go, go to makeup. No, not even no, before. I think the show taped from 5.30 to 6.30. So about a half hour before, we're in the makeup room. I don't know, I'm the times of, anyway. And there's uh, Morley Safer from 60 Minutes doing doing 60 Minutes interviewing Jack Lemon wow. in the makeup chair. And I'm just like, and in my mind, I'm like, oh, this is that world where the, all these people live. Like to yeah. me, just another planet. Literally. So, so I hear Morley Safer say, well, you have been in the 40 years of acting, what have you learned? And I hear Jack Lemon says, I've learned, keep it simple. And I went, I have my answer. All right, keep it simple. <laughs> Thank God. I mean, it's just everything. So I went out and did it and I just looked at the camera, you know, and if you watch me at the end, I'm going, so if you're out there listening and you, you have a problem with lying, give us a call. You know, we have meetings every week at a month at my house in Jamaica. But I'm like, in my mind, I'm thinking, so if you're out there looking at me and you need an actor, hire me, you know? And so that's what I was thinking. Yeah. And uh, and then uh, this uh, guy Mike Eisenstadt, he was he was an assistant to an agent. He couldn't get me signed. I knew him for three years. Finally, he was an agent at the same place, and he finally he said, "I got you signed." Finally, I had to beg him. And then he said, "It was all in the papers. Lauren Michaels is coming back to SNL." He goes, "What about Saturday Night Live?" And I go, "Yeah, right." He goes, "No, I'm serious." I said, "Mike, I have a better idea. Why didn't I land on Pluto?" He goes, no, I'm serious. And he kept going on and on about it. And I started yelling at him, like, will you shut up? I go, you're ridiculous, you know? And, but, and then I said, uh, I got him and I said, hey, can you get me extra work on soaps? Cause I was a messenger. I was like hardly making any money. Soaps paid $90 a day. Mm -hmm. You go, well, how much money is that? I go, well, it was twice what I was making. You know, I was making like, 800 a month less taxes living on 600 bucks a month my rent was 350 you know you know, everyone goes it's it, yeah rent, it's true it's in a way it's hard now the cost of living has gone up but i only had 250 left so i didn't i didn't go to a movie or eat out for seven years i was eating chicken pot pies for 19 cents you know yeah that was a lot thinner and um and uh so he goes well he goes i'll do it if you want but you know uh just think about it for a day. He goes, there'll be a lot of auditions coming up in three weeks. I don't think you should do it, but if you really want to, I will. So the next day I said, okay, I'll wait three weeks. I'll just wait. And then I auditioned and I go, and I just said, I gotta, you know, you get nervous. I go, I gotta go all out. I gotta overcome my fear. And I got everything I auditioned for and I got a movie and a recurring role on a TV series the same day. 
And when they called about the, uh, the, the he was on the phone telling me about the movie and then they got the series. He was like, wait, what? He was, I was in his office. Says, you got the movie? He goes, hold on, hello? Yeah. What? Oh, shit. Because you just got a series. I go, what? The same day? And it all worked. It worked out perfect because the movie was Charles Grodin. Mm -hmm. The series is called Foley Square. And they did, I was signed for two shows. And, and then Diane English, who did Murphy Brown, it was her first show. So after the second show, she goes, come next week to the taping. I go, oh, all right. So I went next week. She goes, I just wanted you here. You're so great. We're putting you in the next three. I go, thank you. So they did. And then they were going to go to series and, and they wouldn't sign me as a regular. And um, I tried. Anyway, it worked out because in the meantime, I got this movie with Charles Grodin. I did that. And he'd recommended me to Lauren Michaels and Lorraine Newman had, and then I, I we were on Catalina Island. I met Lauren uh, at, at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and and he and he's talking and talking. He goes, "How old are you?" I go, "28." And he goes, "Hmm." He goes, "Billy Murray was 28. That's a good age." And in my mind, I'm thinking, "Did he just tell me I have the job?" And it turned out he was. Wow. But I, I we saw that I saw the audition, but actually, you know what happened was. The ten, it's kind of long. The tonight, after the Tonight Show, Jim McCauley, they oh they started. Uh, 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 Mike Klein says I'll submit for the Tonight Show. He this was show business. Then. He submits and tape this guy Fred Weissman at NBC. Fred was in charge of casting in Los Angeles, looking for people for SNL. Yeah. Fred was a dentist. I said, how'd you get this job? He goes, well, I was a dentist and I wanted to get into show business. And my friend said, well, come on, do this. He goes, I don't know anybody. He goes, I, I'm, she goes, I'm being honest with you. So I asked Jim McCauley, who's good. And he said, John Lovitz, because I, I said, how did you even hear about me? He goes, and Jim McCauley from the Tonight Show said I was the best sketch comic in town. I go, me? I go, he did? I go, but what about Phil and, you know, and Tim Stack? These are the guys I looked up to, you know, and yeah. wanted to be like. And they were a little, old. Tim's a few years older than me, and Phil was like nine, but really looked up to him. And, <clears throat> Anyway, and then I, I'm uh, Al Franken and Tom Davis were producing the show, and and they and I met with them in their office at NBC, and then they were asking me questions. They, I go, and they were I just talking. Well, they, they weren't laughing. I go, well, let me do some of my characters for you. So I started. Do, I said, I'll, I'll do so you can see. So I did them, and they were laughing. And then they came to see. They had an industry night at, S, at a, the Groundlings. I was still in it, and they came. I was doing Master Thespian. Nobody was laughing except for Al. And like, he has a very distinctive laugh, like, ah, ah, ah. Yeah. You know? And I remember thinking, I always tell him, I go, thank God that Saturday Night Live guy's laughing. And then he would laugh at that. And uh, anyway, and then, they, and then they had me meet Lauren. And then we had, and then the next thing, they were flying to New York. And I'm on a plane. And they, they picked three actors, three men and three women. The women were Jennifer Tilly, Pam Madison, who is great and she, uh, God rest her soul. She, I wish she had gotten the show. Tom Davis, what a great guy too. Yeah. And uh, Julie Brown, she, the one of the, you know, uh, the, the prom queen's got a gun. Yeah. yeah. And the men were me, Dennis Miller and Damon Wayans. And we were all at, totally unknown. And I'm, I was sitting next to Dennis. I'd never met him. And he always tells us, he's, you know, we're very good friends, you know, now of course. And he goes, he goes, what do you do? I go, I do this liar thing. And Dennis always goes, yeah, I remember thinking, yeah, okay, this chimp's not getting the show. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> well, and, and this is a testament to how, it's a testament to how well you did that character because. Uh, yeah. It was, so you want to know how, I, what really got me the show? This is the craziest thing. So I do this piece in the Growlings, which I could never get on Saturday Night Live, ironically. They wouldn't do it, but I did it in the ground. And this guy got me show the groundlings. And so it was a, Tim Stack was doing a piece about a world war two, a soldier in world war two and how he ended up in the war. So when I got in the ground, he goes, John, I'll add you into the piece. It'll be great. And I go, thank you. He was, Tim's a great guy. Very generous. I go, thank you. So we wrote out my monologue. Now Tim would stand on my left and he would do his, and Tim was six foot four. Right. So I'm like about five ten. So I'd look up at him, you know, like this. Talking. So he's six four. No, that's that's okay. So he'd say, How'd you get in the war? 
And so I'd say, oh, me? I go, brown paper bag. I was trying to do Dana Andrews from the movies. And I go, brown, about I did this for his granddaughter. I met her and, I, and she was crying laughing. She goes, that's him, that's him. I go, I was trying to imitate him. I go, you're Dana Andrews' granddaughter. I used to do this thing. He goes like, how did I end up in the war? We're on the front lines. I go, brown paper bag came in the mail one day. Wrapped inside was a uniform with my name on it. Grandma got to it first. Uh, I, I go, Grandma got to it first. And uh, oh, wait, I go. she put that uniform on. Nobody knew. Because you see, Captain, I go, I go, uh, that uniform fitter. I go, you see, Captain, that uniform fitter like a glove. No, I go, because that uniform fitter like a glove. After she added about 19 yards of canvas material. And then I go, you see, Captain, Grandma was what you'd call a hefty gal. Oh, she liked to eat. In fact, she was quite the chow hound. Anyway, when her platoon boat hit the beach, the old beef cow rolled up. No, I go, she liked to eat. She was quite the chow hound. And I go, <laughs> that was my kid. She was a fat pig. <laughs> anyway, when her platoon boat hit the beach, the old beef cow rolled up on the sand and got stuck under a bar barbed wire fence. So I lost my grandmother. The army sent for me again, and now I'm here. Oh, my God. And then, <laughs> so, and then I tried to get a sketch called, Oh, my God, I'm ignoring it. That sketch is never getting on the show. I tried to get it on like five times. Oh, wow. And then it goes, and then th there'd be a line, and, and, and I do it with Phil, and he goes, who are you talking to? I go, I'm talking to Dombrowski. And he goes, Dombrowski? Dombrowski's dead. And I go, oh, my God. You haven't heard a word I've said. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then Phil's like, listen, I just want to tell you something. Yeah? He goes, I like you. I go, I like you, too. He goes, no, I like you. I go, I know, I like you too. You go, no, no, I really like you. I'm like, what are you saying? Are you saying yes? Oh, my God. It was, it was a Charlton Heston. Every movie he's in, you know, he, he would see something horrible and go, yeah. oh, my God. God. So <laughs> Phil ended up doing Charlton Heston going, oh, my God. I was like, hey, Phil. Anyway, <laughs> um, so when I auditioned for Saturday Night Live on tape, I get there at four twenty. I want to fall asleep. I'm so and I, I'm supposed to be there four thirty. Once in my life, I'm early. Then I I, I didn't get on till eight thirty. I'm waiting four hours. I went. And I fell asleep. I, I saw Humphrey Bogart movie. I go, okay, this relaxed me. I like him. Then I fell asleep. Then I like. Th then I went in the control booth. Dennis Miller, I see on camera, so relaxed, so at ease. I go, oh, okay, I'll be like that. Not like him, but. So I do some, I get in, I do some stuff. And in the hall, Randy Quaid was already cast. Now Randy Quaid is six foot four, okay, mm -hmm. like Tim. So so I did this, that monologue I just did for you. And I, I said, Randy, anything? He goes, that's funny. So anyway, I do I do some stuff for Lauren Master of Thespian, being different characters. And he goes, uh, Randy, stand next to John. He goes, and then uh, he goes, you have anything else? And then Randy leans on and says, why don't you do that thing you did in the hallway about your grandmother? I went, oh, all right. So I go, all right, this is the thing about this. So Randy's on my left, six foot four, just like Tim. This is crazy. So I go, you know, how'd I end up the war? Brown paper bag, came in the mail one day. Wrapped inside was a uniform with my name on it. Grandma got to it first, you know. And, and so, and then I go on and go, and then when I go, so you see, Captain. So I looked at Randy, I went, you see, Captain. And, and then in my mind, I go, oh, he's like, just like Tim. So I went like this. You see, Captain? <laughs> like that. I wasn't trying to be funny. I get the show. I said, Al, what made you pick me? He goes, well, oh, by the way, the, the, uh, he goes, well, you were everything we didn't want in one person, but you were funny. <laughs> you know, oh, thanks a lot. I go, I go, well, he goes, when you went like this, I go, I wasn't trying to be funny. I was just like, oh, he's sick. Is that crazy? <laughs> just did it, let us. And then Lauren says, well, I, Al didn't say that. I did. I go, oh, Al didn't insult me. It was your insult. Thank you. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was an amazing time. That, oh, well, absolutely it does. I mean, that was, 
your turn on the show, uh, Phil. Um, just it was what it was. It was, it was a really really magical time. Um, I was at the right age when I was in my my, my early twenties and stuff, and I was ready for a new cast to climb onto. And and you guys were it. And just every Saturday night when we should have been out hooping it up, it's like no, let's check it out, new episode stuff. And uh, yeah, like I said, Flanagan, I, uh, Mephistopheles. Never uh, maybe laugh every time, <laughs> and I even you, when you're on that show, first of all, we all go the show, the show, you know. You, you, I mean, we that's all we did. It's we're so dedicated to it, and because we, you know, would you know, you, you don't just act, you're creating it, you know, you're writing it, and, and um, we were just so into it, and you feel like you're at the heart of show business. That show, you're at the pulse. Yeah. Cause everybody, there's all these famous people hanging out just to watch. I mean, last time I was there, uh, I, 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 I guessed it. And I think, Jan, uh, yeah, January, they asked me to go on. I did. And, um, which was, I was thrilled to be there. And then I'm sitting there and then I see Steven, Steven Spielberg there. I go, what are you doing here? I'd met him. He's a very nice guy. Yeah. And I was just surprised to see him. He goes, Oh, I, I've been coming here since 75. I go, you have, you like, you don't expect to see him. He goes, yeah. yeah. I go, Oh, and, um, but I mean, constantly, and the biggest rock stars in the world are there yeah. every week. And then the biggest, when I was there, you had to be either, you know, a giant movie star or number one on television. Yeah. Like Ted Dance, it was very rare we had te television hosts. You had to be a giant movie star, giant uh, uh, athlete, or, or uh, you know, huge on TV. It was very rare. Yeah. And it was just every week, and you got to work with these people, and it was just, it was fantastic but it was also really hard it was like 80 hours a week and there was no uh decorum you know there was just you'd show up for a sketch and then al would be like oh you're cut yeah. I, go, oh, I just came here to i go could you have told me beforehand Matt? Mm. so you ended yeah. up <laughs> like you want to do this no there was no <laughs> Sketches off the air. If you had a lot to do one week, the next week nobody would write. For you. They'd be pissed because the writers are trying to get their stuff on. There's, you get your stuff on, and they're like, you know, man. Yeah, uh, 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 as an alumni such as yourself, yeah, over the years, it's it's a uh, it's a competitive environment, and uh, that's why I hear people talking saying. about it after me. The way they describe it, and I go, same. Twenty years later, they're going, oh, it's like this. I go, hmm. Nothing. Yeah, exactly the same. You know, uh, I was, you know, I was, I, I have no complaints. I had a lot of, uh, I got all my characters on except for maybe one or two, one or two pieces, and then I would sneak it in. You know. Well, uh, like I said, I love it, and it opened the door for so much of your other body of work. Uh, I think we're already going to probably go to audience questions real quick, though. I will say this: um, it was a minor recurring character, but I will always have a soft spot for Evelyn Quince and Tales of Ribaldry. <laughs> you know, that was written by um, Christine Zander and John Bowman, and that was one of the pieces where. Uh, it was so well written that I go, oh man, because if something's not well written, you kind of like got to lift it up and figure out how to do it to make it funny. But this thing was so funny. I'm like, I got to lift myself up to this piece. And, um, and I had a, it's funny. I had a character. Um, the rich, it was the richest man in the world, Mr. Canby, but he was just an idiot. And then he'd go like, well, I'm off on safari, everybody. And you'd be in the safari, I'd like, wish me luck, everybody. Good luck, Mr. Canby. Thank you, everybody. Well, goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs> and then he'd leave. He'd come back. And I go, he goes, what do we do? I go, gone. I go, bye, Kit Kat. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. So I'd leave. And they'd be all in suits, you know, and they go, what an idiot. Bye, Kit Kat. Go, get, get Kit Kat. Yeah, and buy, you know, a million shares. Right? Anyway, he's such an idiot. The phone would ring. Yeah. Hello? What? Oh, you're kidding. What? Kit Kat just went up 300 million. <laughs> right? And I come back, hello, everybody. I forgot my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> and then they go, thanks. They go, Mr. Kit Kat. And they go, Mr. Canby, Kit Kat just went up 300 million. I go, oh, well, see, buy what you love and you can't go wrong. Well, I'm off to Safari. Wish me luck, everybody. Good luck, Mr. Canby. Hope you bag an elephant. And everyone's quiet. And I'm like, say it. Hope you bag an elephant, Mr. Canby. Thank you, everybody. Well, goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. 
Anyway, I could never get it on. They go, you can't just say goodbye, everybody. Go. So I'm doing Evelyn Quince, and I snuck it in at the end. I'm Evelyn Quince. Stay next to you for Tales of Ribaldry. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. So I'm like, on, in your face. I just said it. And then they said in the control room, everybody cheered. <laughs> you got it on. <laughs> that wasn't in the script. I just snuck it in. That's one of those. Like, that's that class clown. You can't say it. Oh, yeah? Watch this. Boom. Live TV. <laughs> uh, uh, class by my friend Wyland. Mm. All right. Orange juice. No, Coca. <laughs> no. 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 Uh, so, John, ready to take some audience questions from audience? Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and roll our first one. This comes from Mark G. Wants to know who is your favorite stand up comedian? Well, <clears throat> when I was 16, I, I, I saw the movie Lenny about Lenny Bruce with Dustin Hoffman. It was so great, and I'd never heard of Lenny Bruce. I went to the record store to get his albums, and I did. And then I discovered Woody Allen had been a stand-up, which I didn't know, from 64 to 68, called The Nightclub Years. So I bought their albums, and though those two were my favorite stand-ups uh, then, and then and really influenced me. And then... Um, but then I got SNL, like guys like, you know, Dennis Miller and Dana Carvey and Kevin Nealon are just amazing, you know. And there's a lot of guys. Uh, Joe Coy is huge now. He used to open for me. He's great. Uh, uh, and there's so many. David Tell's great. Uh, Bill Burr, I've just gotten to know. I think he's great. I think Jim Norton. Those guys are so out. You know, I love when they're just out there and you know what they're going to say. Usually I'm appealed to the guys that like they're talking and they, and they seem really angry. <laughs> <laughs> and mad about stuff and they just go nuts I'm gonna check it. You, know, that, you know and that my stand-up's not like that i'm not like that but when they're like that i just it's just hysterical to me but there's so many great ones i think dane cook's great and uh russell peters i became mean, friendly he's great you know a lot of guys and they're, they're all different you know some guys are really clean some guys are really dirty i'm not I don't care, you know, I, as long as, you, to me, you, you have to have a joke behind it. You know, if you're just like yeah. cussing and being dirty, but there's and just cussing, and there's no joke. It, it's it's just, it's not funny. You gotta have a joke, you know? Yeah. And a point of view and it's, 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 and those guys are all unique and they've developed that, you know? And some yeah. are it's dirty and some are clean, but it's it's funny. But I know Jerry Seinfeld forever, you know? And I said, um, I said, Jerry, is it true you always wear clean? He's like, yeah. I go, why? He goes, because then you have to have a joke. Well, you can have be dirty and have a joke, but that, you know, it's uh, uh, my advice is, though, you'll work more if you're clean. That it seems to be that way. Uh, uh, that's very good advice indeed. Mark, thank you. Wonderful question. What do we have next? Here's one from Josh. Which project that you've worked on are you the most proud of? I don't know. I mean, well, the first thing, well, Saturday Night Live, A League of Their Own. I, that, uh, the other movies I, I like, I like doing, but League of Their Own, I'd say I was, I was proud to, honored to be in it because I, I found out that, especially when I was at the premiere and I, I, I'd never heard of this story and it was based as a true story. And I realized I was part of this thing that was, it wasn't just a movie, it was about, you know, uh, uh, something, you know, bigger than a movie. It was about these women who, had an opportunity to play baseball during World War II, and they and they got a Hall of Fame, and I mean, yeah, and then it, 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 and I it was a part of history, and I just felt honored to be a part of that, part of that movie. So probably League of Their Own. Just say fair, fair, Josh. Thank you. I'm Wonderful one. career. I mean, I can't. <laughs> I think you have a lot to be proud of for the critic. Yeah, the critic was really fun, and uh, and it was on ABC. They go, we love it, and then they canceled it after seven shows, and then it followed this went to Fox and The Simpsons, and it was actually. Uh, it was actually a hit. The Simpsons had a 14 rating and we retained 90% of the audience. So when a show does that, they go, it's a hit. And the head of the network, he canceled it anyway. And they never knew why. And they go, and Jim Brooks said, I go, did you say anything? He said, yeah. I said, what are you doing? You're canceling a hit. You're canceling a hit. He goes, I've never seen anything like it. And this is Jim Brooks who did the Mary Tyler Moore show and yeah. taxi and on and on and on. You know, ar it, it, arguably then the, the, the top the top guy in sitcom, like number one. And then they yeah. just, and the Simpsons, I mean, who's bigger, you know, and, and, and they canceled it. 
It was, it was it, my, Al Jean and Mike Reese on The Simpsons, they we were running it and producing it. Mike Reese was so upset. He goes, I'm quitting. He still works, you know, but he was so upset. And people want, I love, I always think, would you do it again? I go, I'd love to. I've been trying to get it going again, but it, it's, it's not up to me. So. Fair. Absolutely fair. So we'll keep fingers crossed for a return in some form. And Josh, thank you. Yes. Fun one. <laughs> what do we have next? From Oliver. Hey, Jimmy Moore, can you be our wedding singer? Yes. Well, I could do it for him. I guess he wants to say it. Oh, yes, it's ladies night. Oh, what a night. Shaka Khan. He's losing his mind. And I am reaping all the benefits. <laughs> Good luck finding a DJ who can move and shake like this. <laughs> I'm on Cameo, you know, and, and you do these personalized videos, and and I can't tell you how many people they go, "Can you do the wedding singer?" They love it, and I, it's and the liar and the master has It's fun, you know. And Cameos, I've been doing that, you know, and it's. Uh, I didn't want to do it. I just thought, oh, it's cheesy. Then I started doing it, and I didn't know idea that people write these reviews. And they're like thanking you. They go, you have no idea what this meant to me. My, you know, my mother has cancer. This, it helped. You, you, my son needed a pep talk. Did this. I mean, they're so grateful. It's unbel It's complete opposite of what I thought it was. People, they get thrilled, you know, and um, this is where I do it from. Yeah. It's not, and you go, well, I'm just wishing you a happy birthday. I'm trying to be funny and do stuff. And then they're just like, it's unbelievable how touched they are. I'm like, God. It's like an honor, you know, uh, to be able to do it. It's unbelievable. I think recently uh, a guy who was a grown up, but he did uh, the SNL Santa Claus Master Thespian sketch with you. He played one of the kids in that sketch. You did one for him recently. Yeah. Oh, that's right, David. And then he, and then he, and then I get a uh, a cameo request from his girlfriend. He goes, "She's forty two now," and I'm like, <laughs> he was like five or six, you know. And I remembered it because he was such a sweet little kid he was so cute and uh, he was oh god if you watch that sketch uh, robert smigel had the idea that massive thespian is is a uh, santa claus at macy's and then and we go well phil should be the manager and be like uh, frank nelson like yes you know <laughs> so we do the sketch and then uh and then the manager fires and mass thespian has no idea what santa claus is and, yeah. you know He's just making, you know, just being literal. Like, you know, what would you want? How, you know, how dare you teach this child to beg? You know, <laughs> <laughs> how dare you teach this child to beg? <clears throat> Shame! Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas! <laughs> we're supposed to improvise. I go, oh, improvisation, you know. And then, and then he's like, you know, I go, what am I supposed to use? You did this. He goes, this made Lauren laugh. I, and, and then I said something to Phil and he goes, he goes well, I never said I was a director. And I'm like, see that you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, and then Phil fires me and I do this whole thing and I go, oh, firing Chris Kringle and I'm dying. I go, the manager, it was the manager. And all these little kids, and you see David, he was so sweet and he's like reaching out to me. You know, and no one told him to do that. He just did it. And I watched that. Whenever I watch that, it like makes me cry. Cause this little kid, he's like so concerned and he's reaching out. He just did it. Yeah. And now he's 42. It's just like, and if you watch it, he's like the cutest little kid. He's so sweet. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, I guess great one. Oliver, thank you. Great question. And a reminder to our audience. If you'd like to chat with our guests, like I am now, or purchase a personalized autograph, sign up at galaxycon.com and let's do another one. This comes from Jimmy. How do you prepare for a voiceover role versus a live action role? <laughs> Besides clothing. Well, the voiceovers usually, I mean, they just, they want, they're, well, there's a director and, and uh, I mean, you read the script, you know, but then you get there and then the director says, you do about four or five takes on each part, each scene. And, uh, and they usually, and then they go, they go, can you, You'll say the line. Usually they want me and my, like, I always say I do characters or I can be funny as my own personality. And they usually want my own personality. Not, sometimes not, it depends. But they they really direct you, so you'll do it. And you just kind of kind of depend on them. They go, this good, but maybe a little faster. Try this, okay, pick it up. Usually they go faster, faster. They they want it for time, you know. And um, 
can you hit this? Can you hit this? Try this, you know. And I, it's still it's on the Simpsons, you know. It's I'm, it's just me, but uh, you know, I I push it, of course. Uh, uh, and they'll say, uh, "Oh, that's good. Hey, try this joke." And I go, "Hey, I, I thought of a joke. Can I try this?" So, but then I ask them questions because you you read it and you think you know, but then you then you do it. But what I found out though is even if you even if it's just a voiceover, you have to to the the best way to do it is you have to totally act the scene out. You can't just kind of do it half. They go, oh, they can't see me, so I'll just go blah blah blah. You can't do that. You got to really act it, act it out fully, you know, the scene. And so I'll usually have the the director. I go, yeah, I want you to read the other line, you know, and uh, and and that's that's the only way to do it. Just go full out, act it out, like you're performing live, you know, like on SNL. Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. Go for broke or go home. Jimmy, thank you. Great one. What do we have next? Here's one from Dawn. Who was your favorite character to play on SNL? Well, the the liar was my biggest character, but that was just like an inside joke between a friend of mine and I. I never thought, I thought maybe well, the year before they go, oh, they said, uh, you look marvelous. I go, I bet you next year they say, yeah, that's the ticket. Because I did it once at this re Groundlings reunion show. And um, before I was on SNL, and the next day, 10 people go, I'm putting that on my answering machine. And I went, so I go, maybe that'll work. But when I was on the show, my favorite character, which was not my biggest, was uh, Master Thespian, because I loved acting. And that was a combination of my desire to be a great actor and my professor, William Needles from college, who was a great Canadian actor, taught me Shakespeare. And it was, a lot of it was him. And uh, I like he had a big voice and Basil Rathbone and John Carradine and uh, John Barrymore. It was like I like those guys. They all they were all like very dramatic, but I thought thrilling to watch and. And their voices, you know, they'd always talk about voices. And I'd be like, oh, I, I was like in college, I would go, I would talk as fast as I think. So they, if you said, what are you going to do today? I go, well, I was thinking of going, to that. maybe I could, you know, what? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and they're like, what? I said, well, I, I was, maybe I could, I don't know. I would talk like that. Like, I didn't know I was doing <laughs> <laughs> And William Hughes goes, you have everything but your voice, but I can imitate him. I don't know how I could do it, but my dad would yell a lot. So I could imitate him yelling. So I was like, very well. I don't know how I can just do it. I, I never really thought about how to do it. But for some reason, William Needles, great actor. He, he, my first class in college, he's like, well, now I'm going to do some Shakespeare for you. I'd never heard Shakespeare. You know, he goes, this is from the opening chorus, Henry V. <clears throat> Oh, for the muse of fire that will ascend the brightest heaven of invention. And in my mind, I'm like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> I've never heard anything like that. So I could imitate him. I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, and I, I, I don't know. I could just do it. It was weird. But I love Basil Rathbone as a Sherlock Holmes. Yes. What's here? You know, and there's all that very, very well. And John Carradine, you see him in, in the Moses. And and you can with Charles Heston. Charles is like, we got to go to the river. All right, we'll go. And it was like <laughs> cannon, and his voice is booming <clears throat> off the uh, off the soundstage walls. You can hear it echoing back. And I ran into um his son um, David Carradine, and and I said, oh, and he's a really nice guy. match the Thes. I was kind of imitating your dad. He goes, oh, I can do that. I go, really? He goes, yeah. And then he did it. And I'm like, he sounds exactly like him. I go, wow. is it? He goes, no, it's like this. It was like, boom. <laughs> I'm like, you, and he's like, you know, a giant cannon. You clumsy idiot. David, get in here. You know, but even bigger. He goes, no, it's this. And then David Carey, he goes, oh, we all imitated him. <laughs> and, uh, Let's go. Well, okay. <laughs> a big fan, big fan of Carey. You know, I just loved acting. Yeah, and, and John Lithgow like, got to do it three times, and he John Lithgow like the nicest man in the world, and just I remember the third time he hosted the show, I go, would well, would you want to do it again? And he goes, yes. I go, oh, all right. And I remember the first time he did it, I go, well, he'd never seen it, you know. So go, I go, well, he's pretty close to getting it. Then the next second time we did it, I go, well, he's doing it equally to me, the same style. Then the third time we did, I go, okay, he's past me now. <laughs> he's making it better. <laughs> but that was what he did on Third Rock from the Sun. He was doing that, that Baudelaire. 
And I ran into him, I go, nice Baudelaire you got there in Third Rock, Minnesota. He goes, yes. <laughs> and that was written by people on Saturday Night Live. They go, just do Baudelaire. I'm like, oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> John, thank you. Great question. What do we have next? And here's one from Michelle. What's the best piece of advice that you've ever received? Very simply. A preacher on the radio, I was going to quit acting. I, 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 I don't know if I want to keep going. I was 26. I had one job in the paper chase the second year. That was it. Nothing. Now I'm 26. I started at 15, 13 years later. You know, year, uh, I graduated college in 79. So I was like, when I was 21, now I'm tw five years later. Nothing. You know, one job as a messenger, no money. All my friends are becoming doctors and lawyers. I go, but no. And I heard a preacher on the radio go, a Southern guy goes, you know, people say they want to be rich and famous, but you got to ask yourself one question. Are you willing to do what you have to do to get what you want? He goes, are you willing to do to get what you have to do to get what you want? Most people aren't. No. And I thought about it and I go, okay, am I willing to do what I have to do to get what I want? And acting, there was no, there's no road. There's no, it's just, it's another planet. And I remember I was like looking down a big black tunnel with no light at the end. And I just was like, I, I go, I just, I can't do it anymore. I'd given up everything to do, you know, and, and I, you know, I had one job for eight hours in the day as a messenger. I was at, worked at a clothing store. Then the other eight hours was just acting. And the messenger job was great because I go, I can practice my acting in my car all day. Like that's how into it I was. And I wasn't getting anywhere. So that night I go, I just can't do it anymore. I quit. I'm just not willing to do it anymore. I just can't. So the next morning I woke up and I, I slammed my fist on the pillow. I'm like, but I don't want to quit. And then I thought, well, then you better get your ass in gear, like work even harder and do everything. And then three years later I did it. And that's really the key to success. I had a great tennis teacher, Alex Almedo. And he said, his son, just, he just passed away suddenly, but he, he was a world champion woman. He goes, he said to his son, desire, devotion, and dedication. Those are the three things you can get anything you find. No, desire, discipline, and Devotion works. Okay. And then like, or Arnold Schwarzenegger says, you perceive, you believe, and you achieve. You know, it's all the same thing. You think, what do I really want to do? Then you make a plan. You write it out, all the steps, and then you do each step. And it gets hard, and then you don't give up. And I, I'll tell you, my uh, uh, son, I have a son, but anyway, he said, um, he sent me this tape of this guy, David Goggins, who is, uh, if you want to get motivated, watch this guy. This guy uh, African-American kid. He goes, I grew up, he was beaten up every day by his father, just horrible. And he was like 300 pounds, uh, killing cockroaches. And he goes, all of a sudden this nest of cockroaches came out. It was on Joe, Joe Rogan interviewed him. He's got to yeah. And he said, I can't do this anymore. So he goes, I want to be a Navy SEAL. And he goes, he goes, I ran a half mile and, uh, I had to stop and I came home and cried. It's, it's an amazing story, but he did it. He became the top Navy SEAL, the top army, r runs these marathon, like 135 mile race in the, in the Death Valley, in the desert. The guy is very motivated. This guy had everything against him, you know, and, and, but then he, now he's not a ranger and he does motivational stuff and it is very motivating. And he, he got to fight. You got to, you know, and my son showed it to me, he goes this, and he said to me, this is what you tell me. I go, yes, you know, I could never do what David Goggins did. And David got yes, you could, but you got to like, you know. Yeah. And he goes, and, and one thing he said was, he goes, I got to, I faced my fears, you know. And uh, Albert Brooks made a oh, movie, Defending Your Life. And at the end of it, he goes, you got to face your fears. And if you do that, you can, and that's, and I said, I was going, I said, I'm going to be a comedian. I wanted to be a comedian. I mean, since I was, you know, funny, since I was five, I went, slept over this kid's house and, he, and we're supposed to go to bed. I'm five. I can't close my eyes to fall asleep and he kept popping up this kid Michael and making faces at me he was four and I'm crying laughing and I, I remember that's when I go I want to be funny like Michael and it's what I really wanted to be besides a baseball player and and when I went to the groundlings I go I'm going to do it I want to be a comedian and I was crying because I was so afraid but then I did it and I was like and then I was like if the fear went I went oh my god this is what I should have been doing my whole you know and um that's my advice you know, are you willing to do what you have to do to get what you want and don't give up. And then the day you want to give up, keep going the next day and you'll, and you'll get, you'll get there. You'll get somewhere. I guarantee you. 
That's my advice. And it worked. Absolutely. It worked. And you're right about Goggins. He had knee surgery, and two days later, he was shooting one of his videos. I just had knee surgery. Here I am running two miles. Yeah, and, but and that's true, and that's amazing. But he would also get injured. I broke my leg, and I couldn't walk. They go, keep your weight off your leg for six weeks. I'm going to go running the next day. The whole thing would have fallen apart. I don't know how he did. I mean, that's just amazing. I don't know what knee surgery he had. My leg was broken. I had two screws in it. And uh, I couldn't have gone running. But that guy's, uh, that guy's incredible. But I think he does extreme things to say, you don't have to be this extreme, but if I can do this, exactly. and I nothing with you. imagine what you could do. And I mean, he's very inspiring. I, I, and I really respect him because that's what people don't get. I was talking to a guy at a car dealership and uh, yesterday and he washes the cars. I go, you can do anything. I go, you're in America. They won't stop you. Nobody will stop you. And if you do, you just go around him. Fuck them, and you did, all the negative people get them out of your life. And you, I had a great manager, Bernie Brillstein, and he said, "Forget the guy on your left, forget the guy on your right. Just look where you want to go and go." And that's what David Goggins is saying. And he goes, "Just he goes, I get up at three, and it's snowing outside. I don't want to run. Okay, I'm running." Yeah, that's what people. It's like when you don't want to do it, but you have to. They go, "I'll do it tomorrow." They go, "No, no, do it." And then you empower yourself, and you go, "Oh, I can do anything." And you yeah. and you can. Watch, I'm going to go around the world at light speed, the speed of light. You saw the little jerk at the end. Yeah, I did. I just did it. In the blink of an eye, I will go around the world. I'll fly, <clears throat> literally. Ready? I think I blinked. No, I blinked. I started to blink, and at the end of the blink, I was back. Okay. Oh, all right. You may say I'm crazy or delusional, but am I? If you slow it down, you'll see that I disappear for a The internet will take you up on that, I assure you. <laughs> Galley Scott viewers, this has been my time with John Lovitz, and it absolutely does not have to be yours, though. If you'd like to chat with our guests like I have today or purchase a personalized autograph, please sign up at galaxycon.com. And while you're there, please check out our schedule of upcoming events just like this one. John, this has been absolutely fantastic. Any final words for our audience before we go backstage? Get a rescue dog. It's the best thing I ever did. And they know they've been rescued. He was a puppy, but he knows it. It's the best thing you could do for yourself. If you're going to go into show business, it's what they say, what Will Rogers said, if you, in your, if you live in Washington, if you want, you want a friend, get a dog. Best advice ever. Th these are in the Will you look straight ahead, please? <laughs> He loves getting your camera, I, I, and then he just doesn't look. Mm. Oh, there he is. <laughs> John, once again, thank you for uh, you and your and your, your creatures there at home for joining us today. It's been an absolute delight. Thank you for joining us on the GalaxyCon virtual stage. Thank you to our audience for joining us today, and thank you all for your great questions. Hope to see you all again soon. Until then, bye-bye, everyone. Take care, thank and please keep washing those hands. <laughs>